I want to move to the heart of the matter. What are particles, what are fields, what is the modern way to think about particle physics? And I go back to a very elementary question, a question that perhaps you didn't even realize physics can answer. Now, if you read about electrons or protons and other particles, you read about the property of the electron. So how do you know that every electron has the same property? Is there a factory in the universe that makes electrons do it with absolute precision? How come they are all exactly the same? Now, there's a great story about how we think about this, and it actually goes back again to John Wheeler. In fact, John Wheeler and his graduate student at that time at Princeton, uh, Richard Feynman. And Feynman describes this story in his Nobel Prize uh, lecture. So in the middle of the Saturday evening, he's called by Wheeler and says, I know why all the electrons are the same, because there's only one electron in the universe. And let me explain his theory. It's really a crazy theory. So here's again our space-time picture. You know, time is running up. Here's an electron. And suppose this electron, it should go up in time, like we all are going in time. Second by second, we're going up. Suppose this electron is allowed to go back in time. Suppose I'm allowed to go back in time. I can kind of go in outside, come back, and stand next to myself. You know, and I would have exactly the same properties. I would be basically cloning myself. So that would be one way. So Wheeler suggested, suppose that the electron can go up and down and up and down and make this kind of big knot. And now think about this as a sequence of pictures. So on the bottom picture, we have one electron. But if you basically cut this whole thing in the middle, you will have a lot of particles basically coming up and going down, electrons and positrons, particles and antiparticles. And they would, of course, all be the same because it's the same particle. It's a pretty amazing description of, uh, of uh, particle physics. Uh, well, allegedly, uh, Feynman immediately said, well, if that's true, there should be a, as many electrons as positrons, etc." And so that theory didn't go much further. But actually, these diagrams we have seen already today, we now call them Feynman diagrams. In fact, I am very charmed by this page out of Feynman's notebooks because this is actually the first page on which he's kind of trying out this idea. He's literally sending the particles back into time and discovering that you can send them back and that the mathematics actually works. You can do this. Picture, particles can go up and down. And he's drawing these diagrams, uh, which are particles with uh, exchanging other particles. And then he's fantasizing that at some point, all the physics books which at that point were filled with calculations and big algebraic expressions, would all be diagrams. And actually, that's true. If you look now in, nowadays in, in, in particle physics books, you'll see Feynman diagrams everywhere. And so this was an absolutely terrific way to understand particle physics. And there's a kind of a nice story that at some point, there was a graduate student walking in, I think, in LA, and he saw this van driving. And he said, wait a moment, you know, there's Feynman diagrams on the van. And he stops the the, the van and the lady driving it, and he says, oh, Madam, I really have to stop you because do you know that actually these, these pictures on your van, they are called Feynman diagrams, and this is like very interesting in physics. And then she says, yes, I know, I'm Mrs. Feynman. <laughs> and here's the van, uh, physical proof of the van. Um, in fact, these diagrams are even crazier than you think. So one thing that actually can happen, and that's what quantum mechanics allows, I mean, quantum mechanics works on this principle that anything basically goes as if you do it fast enough before it's detected. And so, for instance, a particle could go up, it could split in two particles that then join together and go on. The particles in the middle might violate various laws of physics, and so they are not detectable. They would be what we call virtual particles. They exist, if you wish, on paper in our thoughts, in our, in our calculations. They're not the particles that you are made of or the particles of light that uh, we see all around us. In fact, you can even have this crazy thing, which is a pair of particles appearing out of nowhere and then a particle and antiparticle and then annihilating again. Or perhaps this is something that Wheeler really would have liked. Think it of as a single particle going up in time and back in time and endlessly looping around. Now, this is not something that's just happening on on, on computer screens and in our minds. This is actually happening right in this room. So uh, if this is my own kind of attempt of, a re of, a, of an animation 
of what it would look like if we could see these particles. So even empty space, the space around us, is filled with these processes of virtual particles appearing and disappearing again. It's the, the rules of quantum mechanics allow this. In fact, they, they, they determine that this must happen. And there are lots of physical effects related to this. In fact, the Dutch physicist Casimir was the first one to discover this. We call this Casimir energy, Casimir effect. You see it in many, many different areas in physics. So the empty space through the laws of quantum mechanics is actually filled with a lot of dynamics and these kind of processes that are allowed and that kind of to a classical mind wouldn't make any sense. And in some sense, the ultimate consequence of this, and we have heard about this, and I will say a few words more later, is that these processes would fill all of space-time. And actually, it would make space-time not only an interesting material, as Einstein argued, but actually gives it physical properties. It would fill it with energy. Now we call it dark energy, but it would be an energy computable in principle if we understand these processes. Now, these processes are treacherous because literally everything that's out there in the universe will happen in this particular form. So it's very difficult to compute this if you don't have a fundamental uh, knowledge of all processes that are happening. Now, another element underpinning, apart from the, uh, the nature of space and time, particles going up and down, is the concept of symmetry. So we're basically back to the old Greeks, as symmetry as the unifying principle underlying all of modern physics. And one way to think about it is actually a very simple way. It's going back to quantum mechanics. Brian showed that in quantum mechanics, a particle is described by a wave function. Technically, this is a complex function, and it would have a phase. You can kind of basically rotate the wave around in complex space. You can add a complex number to it of unit length, and this would not be visible. So there is a kind of a symmetry that's invisible. You would rotate the wave function, you wouldn't see this. And you can do this essentially at any point in space-time. So even in the description of quantum mechanics, there's a huge symmetry that we call actually a gauge symmetry. It's you rotate a piece of the wave function here, you rotate it there in another way. And actually to do this, you need kind of a compensating field. You need a, uh, what uh, mathematicians would call a connection, but what in physics is called a vector potential. In fact, it's the vector potential underlying electromagnetism. So the modern point of view of electromagnetism, of light interacting with matter, all comes down to this particular symmetry. It's a symmetry of nature, and by implementing the symmetry of nature, you get a field, the electromagnetic field. The electromagnetic field then, under the laws of quantum mechanics, where waves and particles can be interchanged, will get the character of a particle. Basically, by taking a wave and kind of minimizing the amount of energy in the wave, you, at some point, uh, that's the original idea of quantum mechanics, you get little quanta, little bits of energy, goes that, the, to the very beginning of quantum mechanics, of Planck in 1900 and Einstein in 1905, and so you can actually argue that this mathematical object becomes a physical field, becomes a particle. In fact, it will be a massless particle of spin one. That's determined just by the theoretical structures. And a, a, a modern way to look at the electric magnetic forces. So think about you, we have two magnets or two charged objects. They have a force that they're interchanged. It's a one over r squared force, just as in gravity. The modern way is that it will be transmitted by particles. So there's a, a force carrying boson, the gauge boson, that produces that uh, force. Now, one point here, because you might say, wait a moment, if I put two magnets, I don't see light flashes going from the left to the right. Now, where are these photons? Can you stop them, for instance, by putting your hand in between it? These are virtual particles. So these are particles that describe these processes. They're not particles. The wavy line in between, as it stands, is not something you can actually measure uh, in general. And so it's part of our description, but it's a crucial way to describe that particular force. And in fact, this way of understanding electromagnetism is key to understand all the forces in, that are relevant for particle physics. And take for another example the strong force, that the strong force uh, acts on the, 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 the nuclear constituencies, on the quarks. Quarks come in, so say, in three colors. 
So they're very similar to the wave function of an electron. However, it doesn't have a face, it has kind of an arrow. So you should really think about it. It's actually a good metaphor because any color you see is a constituent of the three elementary colors, red, green, and blue. So in actually, a color is a vector in a three-dimensional space. And so a quark has this kind of vector in three-dimensional space that can rotate around in any possible direction. If you actually think about symmetry, so here I've tried to visualize how you think about it. So if you have a quark field, that field would be ever in space and could be rotated around. This is, would be a global symmetry where every point in space-time, the symmetry acts in the same way. But uh, the symmetries in nature are much, much larger. In fact, you're allowed to rotate that in every special point. So the first was more like a communist model, all in sync. And this is more kind of a chaotic model where every uh, particle is allowed to rotate in any way he or she wants. And so this huge symmetry is out there. And in a kind of a uh, bit of a metaphorical way, you can think of the force fields as kind of, kind of collective waves in all of these kind of objects that are rotating around, kind of the, the color field as it is uh, at each different point in space and time. So symmetry is absolutely crucial, but then you should take these symmetrical objects and bring them in the realm of quantum mechanics. And if you do it in quantum mechanics, you get pictures like this. For instance, this is a process very similar to a process where two electrons would interchange a photon and get the electric force. These are two quarks interchanging a so-called gluon, which is the equivalent of a photon for the strong force. You see a red quark can turn into a green quark and vice versa by interchanging an intermediate object, which would be a red-green object, a gluon that has, is now labeled by two charges, two colors. In fact, this logic tells you that you don't have a single uh, gluon, but you would have a three-by-three three matrix of these objects interchanging the force. And there's a small mathematical certainty that it, in the reality it's not nine, but it's eight. It's kind of the diagonal element of the matrix gets removed. But uh, this is actually how nature works. Uh, these kind of uh, uh, colored uh, force particles are the ones that actually, by which the quarks interchange their, their nuclear forces. And in fact, there's a great thing here, because if you would do the equivalent of shining two light beams to each other, uh, but now made out of these gluons instead of photons, you see actually that the gluons themselves can interact. For instance, a red-blue and a blue-green gluon can fuse together and make a, a red-green third gluon. So these forces are complicated. They can't travel over long distances. They kind of tangle up through their self-interactions. But their self-interactions are given by a very clean mathematical rule. For those of you who know this, it's a matrix multiplication. So it actually is the theory of uh, matrices, of linear algebra, uh, the theory directly of group theory that actually is used to describe the interactions of the force-carrying carry particles. So this all kind of makes wonderful sense. And in some sense, the only thing that you have to know about the standard model, if you're a theorist, is okay, I know there's a symmetry group underpinning the whole thing, give me the symmetry group. And this is the answer. After a painstaking series of experiments, decades of struggle, we came to this final line, the little formula sitting in the black box that I opened. And so it tells you what the symmetry of the standard model, so of the particles that we know is. It's U1 cross SU2 cross SU3. And uh, it's, it's a kind of a telegraphic shorthand of what the content of the standard model is. And it's describing for you both the electroweak force, which are uh, the, the, the usual electromagnetism and the weak interactions of radioactive decay, for example, and the strong force that holds the nuclei together. So that's one thing you have to know. You have to know, give me the symmetry group. And the second thing you have to know, give me the matter and how it's represented, how the symmetry group acts on the matter constituencies. In the same way that we said quarks can have three colors. So what are kind of the colors of all the particles? And this we have seen in Maria's talk, so that's actually just giving you the matter content of the standard model. And in a mathematical way, that's just a representation of the gauge group. So you need two things from that, from that point of view, a gauge group and a representation. 
And then kind of the mathematics take care of it. It tells you how the forces are interacting with matter, how the forces interact among themselves. I think this is a fundamental way. We should realize that this is something that really has played over the last hundred years. It's a fundamental way in which we describe nature in terms of matter on one hand, forces and radiation on the other hand, and a very specific logic how the two are interconnected. Are there any questions about this point of view? And in fact, I should say that the uh, physicist Lorentz was essentially the first one who sketched this, this way of thinking about nature. Of course, in those days, it was just light interacting with matter, light interacting with electrons. But in some sense, we have generalized that understanding to all of matter and all of the forces. So yes. No. <laughs> That's the perfect introduction to my next chapter because you know, there's one sense, well, wonderful, you know, we, uh, you just give me this group and we are, we're all set. But then why this group? You know? Why not SU7 or, you know, or the, and is this the most beautiful, most special symmetry group that's there? No, there are actually, there, is, there are candidates uh, for exotic things called E8 or something, which Perhaps mathematicians would say, well, if you have to pick anything, pick this one, you know, because it's totally unique and special. This looks like kind of run of the mill. Uh, so why? 